All right, let's go ahead and get started, everybody. Uh, welcome back to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. <clears throat> this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, and tonight we are going to, <clears throat> excuse me, tonight we're going to continue looking at the Samyutta Nikaya, and we're going to, in all likelihood, we're going to finish the chapter on the nuns, on the bhikkhunis. So if you've been coming to Dharma Doors lately, which I think all of you have, at least all of you that are here, you know that we've been reading through this tiny little section of the connected discourses. And we've been hearing these beautiful little sutras that are dedicated to these 10 different nuns, these 10 different bhikkhunis. Uh, we've done eight of the 10 sutras so far, and so probably tonight we'll finish up with the last two. Um, yeah, I want to mention a few things, sort of that I, a few ideas that I started last time, started talking about. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so a couple of things. So last time... <coughs> Let's let, actually, yeah, let's start with this. So last time we dealt with these three sisters. Uh, they were actually Shariputra's sisters, if you know Shariputra the wise. And so that was a uh, Chala, Upachala, and Sis, Sis Supachala. So these three sisters. And one of the things that I wanted to, I didn't mention it last week. So those three sisters, we have records of their poems, the same poems. We have records of them that are in the, uh, the, the Therigatha, the poems of the nuns, which is a different collection. But what's interesting, or I find it interesting, is that the poems are in a, they are attributed to different sisters in that way. And so this could just be an, an error. One of them's right, one of them's wrong. Or, and this is my suspicion now that we've been kind of looking at these now for a few weeks, I mentioned last week that I was st starting to detect that these 10 sutras they seem to be in a particular order. And what I mean is, is that the teachings are getting progressively deeper and the teachings are each sort of building off of each other. And so I wouldn't be surprised if the different sisters' poems were kind of reconfigured to conform to this progression in that way. Who knows? We probably will never know. But just to remind you, we have these nuns, and by all accounts, these are historical people, historical women. Now, were they really all at one time sitting alone in the woods? <clears throat> and were they all tempted by Mara? Maybe. Maybe that's what happened. But you could also imagine, and this is just a possibility, you could also imagine a kind of a, um, a campfire scenario where the ladies are going around in almost like a, you know, a, a rap battle, <laughs> like where they're going around and kind of riffing off of each other and kind of creating these poems about how to deal with fear, how to deal with Mara, the evil one, or maybe some combination of the two, which is that they had all had these experiences alone in the woods of being frightened in a different way, and then all got together one night around the campfire and constructed some poems about it. Who knows, but our first nun, Alivika, she goes off to the woods alone, and she's confronted by Mara, who tells her, what are you doing out here in the woods? There's no escape from the world. 
ha ha, this is my domain, basically Mara is saying, and there's no escape from it. But Alavika says, oh, no, no, there is an escape from it. Then we go to the, then we go to the next nun, Soma, and basically Mara said, okay, there is an escape from the world, but not for women. And that's where Soma says, what does male female have to do with this? As far as I understand the Dharma, it is beyond those dualistic distinct distinctions. And so that's how Soma defeats Mara in that way. Then Gotami is also in the woods, our third nun. She's tempted by Mara in terms of how about a nice household life as a, as a wife? Why not find a husband? What are you doing out here alone? Why don't you find a nice man? To which Gotami says, I have put down all of those desires. Then our next nun, Vijaya, is confronted by Mara, who basically says, let's party. <laughs> You're young. I'm young. Let's, let's celebrate the five sensual pleasures together. Once again, Vijaya says, no thanks. I put an end to all sensual desire in that way. I, I hand those things right back to you, Mara. And then the next nun, uh, Upalavanya, is uh, also all alone in the woods. And Mara comes and says, aren't you afraid being out here all alone? But Upalavanya has developed all the supernatural powers. And so she says, are you kidding me? I'm not even afraid of you, let alone a bunch of bandits and robbers. And then that's when we got to our three sisters last time. And so <clears throat> to the eldest of the sisters, Mara has sort of changed his tone. And so he's sort of, he's tried to tempt, cajole, pressure all of these women from giving up their practice. So with Chala, the, the eldest of the sisters, he comes with a sort of different approach <clears throat> and saying, what do you want? Whatever it is, like, what's wrong? What's wrong with this world? And basically asking her, you know, you tell me what's wrong with it, and then I can kind of fix it in that way. But she says, no, the thing that's wrong with this world is birth. And we explored a very a few different ways that we could interpret that. And so then to the next sister, Upachala, he says, what are you doing meditating here? Why don't you try getting into a heavenly realm where it's all pure bliss? And then our Upachala says, no, because even the gods are in bondage to pleasures, and even they eventually get kind of recycled in terms of reincarnation. And then we come to the youngest of the sisters. So this would have been the last nun that we talked about last week. And to see Supachala, Mara asks, well, basically, what do you believe in? What, whose creed, like what view do you have? What do you believe is going on out here? And our youngest sister establishes this idea where she says, outside of here, meaning sort of outside of our meditation space out here in the woods, outside here are followers of creeds. And they place their confidence in views. She says, I don't approve of their teachings because they're not skilled in the Dharma. <clears throat> she says, but I follow the teachings of this enlightened one, the Buddha, of the Sakya clan in that way. <clears throat> the one who has attained an end of karma 
and who is liberated in the extinction of acquisitions. Now, I want to start there because I want to kind of dig a little deeper really quickly into this idea of the of having a view. I spoke about it a bit last time, so I'm not going to go into to super detail, but I want to kind of remind everybody that yes, we're talking about drishti, the idea of having a view. And as I often mention, you can understand that idea of a view as having a political view, having a religious view, having a world view. And we're basically talking about having these kind of, um, they're more than an opinion. A view is a deep seated belief. And so when Mara says, what do you believe in? What is your view? What is your deep seated belief out, out here in the woods? And she says, oh yeah, I don't, I don't have one. I don't have that. In fact, the person who I follow, like the, the Buddha teaches no view. And a couple of things about that. The one thing that I want to kind of make really clear is that, and this is what I tried to mention last time, yeah, we can talk about religious views, political views, and so on, but there's one particular view that Buddhism is sort of always talking about when they re are referring to wrong views, and the wrong view for Buddhism is the view that there's a self here the idea of the Atman that you're probably familiar with. Now, what I mentioned last time is this really important Buddhist sutra called the Brahmajala Sutra, Brahma's Net, that's all about all of these different worldviews. And from the Buddha's kind of, from the teachings of the Buddha, what we recognize is that all the views political views, like being of this party or that party or this particular political leaning or that political leaning. So all political views, all religious views, cosmological views, all views are based on the idea that there's a self here. All of them. And I want to remind you that when we're talking about a view you might think that after you die, you go to heaven. You might think after you die, you go to hell. You might think after you die, you just get recycled in an endless uh, reincarnation cycle. You might think after you die, you just fall apart and become nothing. So those are a bunch of radically different views. One is scientific materialism. One is theism. One is rather nihilistic. So there's all these different views. But notice they are all based upon the same idea. Which is that there's a self here now. And now it's a question of what's going to happen to this self here now. The Buddha began with the question of who, what, who, what are we talking about? Let's establish that first then we could speculate about where it goes. And then that's where Buddhism or the Buddha realized, oh, there isn't that self we're talking about or thinking in terms of. So that's that idea of a view and how it is that our young sister here says, yeah, we don't have that view. We are not holding to a view in that way. So at the end of last week, we got to talking about the idea of, well, some fundamental Buddhist ideas. We got to talking about conditioning, habits, like habit energy. And ultimately, what we kind of got to was the idea that every movement of the body the heart beating, the lungs expanding and contracting, the eyes blinking, all of the behaviors of the body 
are habitual. <laughs> They're automatic. You, you don't need to worry about it. It will just keep breathing. It will just keep blinking. All of these things will keep happening all by themselves because it's a conditioned body of form. But then we also talked about how we are, how this is conditioned in terms of language, where we have been trained or conditioned to read certain languages and to speak in certain languages. And in the same way that we don't have to think about breathing, we just breathe. We don't really think about reading. We just read. We don't really think about speaking. We just speak in that way. And so recognizing that <laughs> you, we, we need to recognize that nobody kind of comes out of the womb and is born speaking a language fluently. <laughs> All beings have to be trained in that language. And then they eventually get so comfortable in that conditioning that they actually start talking to themselves. We start talking to ourselves in that language. And that's thinking to a certain degree. And so what I'm getting around to is that even thinking is habitual from a Buddhist point of view, which is that we do not go, I'm going to think about this in five, four, three, two, one, and now I have the idea. Ideas just boop, 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 boop. And we are then having them, meaning we are experiencing the ideas. The idea that we are, are thinking with agency, the idea that we are the doer, that's that self that doesn't exist. The idea of the agent of the thinking, the agent of the speaking, and the agent of the physical action. So from a Buddhist point of view, all of those things, all three sources of karma, body, speech, and mind, are on autopilot. And it's just responding habitually to a bunch of other <laughs> habitually conditioned beings. And it's a big reinforcement festival in that way where we're just reinforcing each other's conditioning in that sense so that's where we left it last time was with this idea where we have basically sort of removed the idea of free will and agency we have d brought everything down to the idea of it just being habit energy and the idea that there is a performer of the actions. That's that idea of a self, which is the view of a self, which is being denied. Now, I wanted to set us up with that understanding so that we could talk about Selah, our next bhikkhuni. So if you've got the big uh, wisdom publication version, we're on page 228. We're in the Bhikkhuni Samyutta section, right? The Bhikkhuni section, and we're about to do uh, Sutta number nine. So at Shravasti or Sabati in Pali, then in the morning, the Bhikkhuni Sela dressed, went into town, begged for food, came back, and then she sat down at the foot of a tree for the day's abiding. Then Mara, the evil one, desiring to arouse fear, trepidation, and terror in the bhikkhuni sela, desiring to make her fall away from concentration, approached her and addressed her in verse saying, By whom has this puppet been created? Where is the maker of this puppet? Where has the puppet arisen? Where does the puppet cease? So, 
before we read Salah's response, I want to make it clear that Mara is now responding in a way to what our younger sister, C. Supachala, said. So she said this thing about, oh yeah, no view, no self, basically. And so Mara's responding to that idea of saying, oh, okay, so you're just a puppet of karma. Oh, okay, so you're just a puppet then, being habitually, you know, the, all the actions are habitual. So you're like a puppet. And one of the things I want to mention, and I don't want to, I don't want to get too crazy with this because I haven't done the, I haven't done the deeper, deeper research, but I find it interesting. And everybody knows if you've been coming to Dharma doors, you know, I, I, we do a lot of language and what we learn is, you know, so much of the English language is descendant from kind of you know, the Indo, Indo-European languages, Sanskrit, Pali, and so forth. But the word for puppet is a bimba. And I can't help but notice that that sounds a lot like bimbo. And I don't know where the English word bimbo comes from. And I'm very curious to know if it comes in any way, shape, or form from this bimba, a puppet interesting connection especially if you if you kind of read these poems the way that i'm reading them where there's like mara the evil one you know that the idea of mara of course not an actual devil but the idea of mara and so then this way of taunting uh, taunting these women or taunting selah by saying who created this bimbo then in that way meaning he's you could take it as him being kind of you know poking a little bit in that way it wouldn't be beyond mara to to do such things <laughs> so we don't need to dwell on it too much but i do want you to know that the word for puppet is a bimba and so mara taking this idea of everything being conditioned habitual energy so you you are like karma's puppet Mara asks, okay, so who created this puppet then? Where's the maker of the puppet? Where has the puppet arisen? And where will the puppet cease? All right. So interesting questions, interesting ideas. Let's see what she has to tell us. So, of course, then it occurs to uh, the Bikuni Sela. Now, who is this? A human? A non-human? <gasps> it's Mara, the evil one, coming to tempt me, desiring to make me fall away from concentration. Then the Bikuni Sela, having understood, this is Mara, the evil one, replied to him in verse, saying, <clears throat> This puppet is not made by itself, nor is this misery made by another. <clears throat> it has come to be dependent on a cause. With the causes break up, <clears throat> with the causes break up, it will cease. As when a seed is sown in a field, it grows depending on a pair of factors. It requires both the soil's nutriments and a steady supply of moisture. Just so, the aggregates the, and the elements and these six bases of sensory contact have come to be dependent on a cause, have come to be dependent on a cause. With the cause's breakup, they will cease. Then Mar the evil one, realizing the Bikuni Salas knows me, sad and disappointed, Mara disappeared right there. Okay, so a, a lot of things to di dissect in this. We're, we actually might be here for a little while. So in response to the initial question regarding where the where'd the puppet come from then? This question of 
where did the puppet come from? And you'll notice that Salah, her answer is, well, this puppet is not made by itself. Nor is this misery, this dukkha, this suffering, made by another. So you kind of need to know, or you need to understand that there's a couple of different things kind of being conflated or kind of rolled together in this. And so it's it starts with this language about the puppet, and then she shifts the language to a being about the misery or the suffering. And if you have the the wisdom publication edition and you read, I guess it's footnote 359, you'll 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 hear this what I'm about to mention. But there's this kind of really old um uh, I guess, philosophical debate going on in India, sort of within the world of Buddhism. And it's this question of, does suffering, dukkha, does it come from outside? Or does it come from inside? For example, let's just, let's think this out for a second. It's the question of like, so let's say, let's say I hate pickles. And so let's say that if I eat a pickle, it's like, oh, like I don't like it. So for me, in that sense, it would be dukkha. It would be suffering to, and as the Buddha says, it would be suffering to be in contact with the displeasurable in that sense. So this pickle situation, I've eaten this pickle and now I don't like it. So the question is, is that suffering due to the pickle or is it due to like my mind? And of course we, we have to realize that there's other people in the world <laughs> that like pickles and they might eat a pickle and be delighted. So it's hard to then put it on the pickle. And you would then say, ah, no, suffering is self-created in that way. But wait a minute. If it's self-created, then why did I need the pickle? If you see what I'm saying, it's not like I just walked in the restaurant and got upset, <laughs> which would happen if the suffering was caused by myself. I wouldn't need, in other words, I wouldn't need the pickle to be suffering. So it is due to the pickle. What's it due to? What, what, what is the cause of the suffering? Is it due to external things pushing in on me? And if there weren't those external things pushing in on me, I wouldn't be suffering. Or could the external things be pushing in on me all they want? And it's just my mind that's going to be suffering or not. And this was the big debate. This is the big debate in back in the days in, of the Buddha back in India. And the Buddha is going to come along and ultimately say, as Sila says, which is that suffering is neither created by the self, nor is it created by the other in that way. So her, the first two lines of the first stanza of her poem, where it says, this puppet is not made by itself, nor is this misery made by another. So she is negating the classic two possibilities in that way. And what she's saying is, is rather it has come to be dependent on a cause with the causes break up, it will cease. So one of the things that we need to kind of be aware of, so if you didn't catch it, if you didn't notice, she's talking about dependent origination. That is the, the Buddhist answer for this conundrum in terms of is suffering created by self or other? 
No, it's created by a confluence of causes and conditions in that sense. And that's what we're about to get to with her set with the second stanza of her poem. But I do want you to recognize that when she says that it's come to be dependent upon a cause, she's evoking the language of dependent origination. Now, what we need to know about, or before I kind of go much further, we need to keep in mind regarding dependent origination, and let's keep in mind the classic formulation of dependent origination, which is the 12-link chain of causation. So you might be familiar with those 12 links, right, that begin with ignorance, which is the necessary condition for samskara, for the habits that we are talking about. So in other words, our conditioning or the habits, samskara, are dependent upon the cause of ignorance. But then you have consciousness, which is dependent upon the cause of our samskara, but remember, samskara is dependent upon the cause of ignorance. And then you have nama rupa, name and form, which is dependent upon consciousness to be thinking in terms of name and form, but you don't have that consciousness unless it's already dependent upon the samskara, and you don't have the samskara unless it's already dependent upon the ignorance. So even though she says the misery of the suffering, the dukkha has, it comes to be, or the puppet even as well, comes to be dependent upon a cause. I don't want to make it sound like it is so directly causal to one cause, because the whole point of this is it's a confluence of causes. But what we need to recognize, though, is, is that, that that one link in the chain, like, let's say, Nama Rupa, name and form. Remember, it's dependent upon this, but this is dependent upon this, and this is dependent upon that. So what you have is this very tenuous house of cards where everything is dependent upon something else, but each link is actually being held up by the other links. An example that the Buddha gives all the time is two reeds resting against each other. And the idea is, is that one of they would both fall down, but when they're resting against each other, they hold each other up. And so the idea of falling down in that sense is being non-existent. And so each of the links is not non-existent for resting against the other link, which is resting against the other link, which is resting against the other link. And then, of course, if you were to wake up, meaning if you were to not be ignorant, you would not keep reinforcing those habit energies of samskara and therefore consciousness as such would cease to be, and there would be no nama rupa, there would be no place for nama rupa. So that's what she's talking about in terms of with the causes breakup, it, meaning the dukkha or the puppet, will cease to be. All right, everybody okay with the first stanza? So I'm looking forward to the next stanza because there's so much going on in this. So <clears throat> her second stanza is an example. As when a seed is sown in a field, it grows depending on a pair of factors. It requires both the soil's nutriment and a steady supply of moisture. <clears throat> so it would seem, so let me, this, this will be interesting. I've used this example. This is an example that I've used before in different Dharma doors. So you might've heard me ask the question, 
what makes a car go? And the idea here is, is that you could say, well, if you push on the gas pedal, you push the gas pedal down, it causes it to go. Really? What if there's no gas in the car? You could push the pedal all you want and it's not going to go. What if I had all the gas in the world and the gas pedal, but no spark plugs or no carburetor or you no wheels? Can you really point to one cause of a car moving forward? There are a variety of causes that, or causes and conditions. There are a variety of causes and conditions that need to be appropriate for a car to go. Her poem is saying the same thing regarding a seed being planted. You could plant it in really good nutriment, but if you have no water, it won't grow. Or you could plant it in a lake, <laughs> but no nutriment and it won't grow. So you need both the nutriment of the soil and you need the water for the, the seed to sprout and grow. So that's sort of the basic idea of what the, you know, the, of what Silla's poem is kind of conveying. But what you might not have noticed is this is actually a reference to something super important. So I don't know, I don't know if everybody will have the Anguttara Nikaya, the numerical discourses of the Buddha. This is this is a big volume. You would probably know it if you had it. Um, so there's a famous sutra in here, and it's very short. So let's read it. This is sort of this is like a, a secret Dharma doors inside of a Dharma doors. So this is um so if if you if if you know the Anguttara Nikaya, so this is the numerical discourses of the Buddha. These are a bunch, a bunch, a bunch, a bunch of small, very old suttas. Um it's divided in a very interesting way. It's divided in all of the sutras are divided into collections depending upon the list that the Buddha is teaching about. So you might be familiar with how the Buddha has all these lists of like, you know, there's like the three jewels and the three treasures, or sorry, those are the same thing. And then the three poisons and there's also the three sources of karma and there's the three realms. So there's all these lists of three, but then you also know that there's like the four noble truths and the four right efforts and the four foundations of mindfulness. These sutras are all gathered together based upon, is the Buddha talking about a list that's in ones? in twos, in threes, fours, fives, and it goes all the way up to tens, lists of 10 things. The sutra I'm about to read is from the threes, the groupings of threes, and it's the 77th sutra in the group of threes. It happened that one day the Venerable Ananda approached the Buddha and said, World Honored One. It is said, Bahava, Bahava, which can be translated either as becoming or existence or being, but the word is Bhava. Oh, it can also be translated as essence, but it is one of the 12 links of dependent origination. Bhava is the link that comes right before birth because birth is the birth of something. And that thing is, in other words, if something is born, 
it's got to be something, you know, a mammal, a bird, uh, uh, it's got to be some type of thing. And that's the idea of its bhava, its essence. And then this idea of bhava or essence, which then is the thing which is born. Well, if you have the birth of a thing, then you can be guaranteed that you will have the death of that thing. So the question that Ananda has is bhava, bhava, what's bhava? So, world honored one, it is said, bhava, bhava, existence, existence. In what way, world honored one, is there existence? The Buddha said, if Ananda, there were no ripening of karma in the sensory realm of desire, would sensory sense sphere existence be discerned? And Ananda says, no, world honored one. Thus Ananda, for beings hindered by ignorance and fettered by craving, karma is the field, consciousness the seed, and craving the moisture for their volition and their aspiration to be established in an inferior realm. In this way, there is the production of renewed existence in the future. If, Ananda, there were no ripening of karma in the form, in the form realm, would form sphere experience be discerned or not? Ananda says, no world honored one. Thus Ananda, for beings hindered by ignorance and fettered by craving, karma is the field, consciousness the seed, and craving the moisture for their volition and aspiration to be established in a, in a middle zone, in a middling ring, the realm of form. In this way, there is the production of renewed existence in the future. And then finally, it says, and if, Ananda, there were no ripening of karma in the formless realm, would formless sphere experience be discerned? No, world honored one. Thus, Ananda, for beings hindered by ignorance and fettered by craving, karma is the field consciousness the seed and craving the moisture the moisture for their volition and aspiration to be established in a superior realm which is the formless realm and in this way there is the production of renewed existence in the future it is in this way ananda that there is existence now this is a deep sutra we don't need to get into talking about the the other ideas but this sutra as far as i can tell is the origin of the metaphor which is the idea of karma being like the field consciousness the seeds and craving is this moisture that that feeds those seeds in that way that by the way is what our nun Sila is referring to. This is a very, very well established Buddhist metaphor. And what we're going to get into, and I'm, I'm glad we, we have time to do this. So what we're talking about, or what we're about to start talking about, is this idea of bijas. So B-I-J-A, bija, is the Sanskrit word for a seed. And what we are going to talk about now is this idea of karmic seeds. So what you may or may not know, a lot of you, I think, do know this. In the much later Mahayana form of Buddhism, and even in late 
Mahayana Buddhism, there is the development of a school of Buddhism known as Yogacara, the mind only school of Buddhism. And that school of Buddhism is very kind of famous for developing this idea of karmic seeds. But what I want you to know is, is that the Yogacara school did not invent this idea of karmic seeds, not at all. In fact, it is one of the oldest Buddhist metaphors that there is. Now, the one thing that I want to state, I'm going to say it now, and I'm probably going to say it multiple times. We need to remember that this idea of karma being like a field and consciousness being like seeds and craving being like water, it's a metaphor. It's a metaphor. And what I mean by that is, is that I want to walk us through the, like this particular idea of karmic seeds, but the danger, the risk is that we start thinking of these as phenomenal things. Like what I mean is, is that I'm going to do my best to, in the short time that we have, I'm going to do my best to kind of like develop this idea for you, but it's going to be tempting to start thinking about these ideas, these ideas as little seeds in your mind. And that's going to be the wrong way to do it. So let's, let's walk through this, by the way, actually, before I even forget to do this, I do want to mention this. So, I read to you from the Anguttara Nikaya and that sutra of Ananda asking about bhava or existence. That seems to be the oldest reference to the seed, soil, moisture metaphor. Then within the early Buddhist tradition, like in the Samyutta Nikaya, you get the the nuns, you get a nun like Selah, who seems to be familiar, of course, with this Buddhist idea. And so she's going to incorporate that as part of her poem, that it's like a seed being planted and all of that. But then, so fast forward, maybe, maybe three or 400 years, so if the Buddha was around 500 BC or so, and the original like reference to this idea of the seeds and the soil, if that was around 500 BC and Salah, the nun, probably, you know, again, I'm going to assume she was a real historical person alive during the time of the Buddha. So also from then. But then you fast forward about four or 500 years and you have the full-on emergence of Mahayana Buddhism. And then you maybe fast forward another hundred years or two and you have this fully formed, <clears throat> like a fully formed Mahayana Buddhism that has its own world of new sutras, right? These much longer, um, you know, much more ornate sutras like the Lotus Sutra, for example, but all of the sutras, all of these Mahayana sutras. Of course, the mother of all Mahayana sutras is the Avatamsaka Sutra, right? The Flower Garland Sutra. So, Oh, by the way, let me here. So if you didn't know and you're interested, there is a new translation of the Avatamsaka Sutra that just came out by Kalavinka Press. Um, this is a really good translation, by the way. So just if you've never seen it, this is the entire Avatamsaka Sutra. It's a it's a big sutra. And I'm going to read to you very quickly a little bit from chapter 26 of the Avatamsaka Sutra. Chapter 26, 
of the Avatamsaka Sutra is actually its own sutra sometimes. It's it's sort of its its own self-standing sutra. And chapter 26 is the 10 stages sutra. So you might have heard about the 10 Bahumis, the 10 Bhumi stages of the Bodhisattva. Well, chapter 26 of this whole giant sutra, just chapter 26 is the 10 stages sutra. And I'm going to read to you a little section, just a really tiny section from the sixth ground, the sixth stage of a bodhisattva's development. If you haven't studied the 10 stages, don't worry. But one thing you need to know is that in the sixth bhumi, that's where and when the bodhisattva dedicates their practice to understanding dependent origination. That's what the sixth bhumi, the sixth stage is all about developing an understanding of dependent origination. And I want you to hear how this sutra, this very fully developed, very late stage Mahayana sutra, I want you to hear how they explain dependent origination. The Bodhisattva, this is not the, a, a Buddha, this is a Bodhisattva named Vajra Garbha. And that, uh, oh, and if you happen to have the Kalavinka Press version, I'm on page 959, just if you happen to have it. The Bodhisattva tells us, common people, uh, so unknowing, are attached to a self, always seeking existence or non-existence, and they engage in wrong thought pursuing falsely based actions and following erroneous paths wherein they accumulate and increase offense generating actions, merit generating actions, and imperturbable actions. Through all courses of actions, karma, actions, they plant mental seeds associated with the contaminants and with the grasping that further precipitates subsequent becoming, birth, aging, and death. This is a circumstance said to be one wherein one's karmic samskara, one's karmic conditioning or one's karmic habitual actions serve as a field One's consciousness serves as seeds. Ignorance keeps them covered in darkness. The water of craving moistens them, and pride in oneself irrigates them. As the net of views, the net of drishtis, as the net of views grows, the sprouts of name and form, nama rupa, are produced. As name and form develop, the five physical sense faculties are formed. With the oppositional impingement of sense objects on the sense faculties, contact is produced. This impingement generated contact produces feelings. Subsequent wishing for more feelings produces craving. Increased craving brings about grasping, and increasing grasping produces becoming, bahava. Having produced bahava, becoming, it is one's generating of the five aggregate bodies as one courses in the various destinies. It is all that that constitutes birth. The deterioration following upon birth, that is what constitutes aging. And the culmination of this process in mortality is what brings about death. 
When aging and death arrive, one is seized by intense mental torment, and on account of this intense mental torment, one is then beset by distress, worry, sorrowful lamentation, and the accumulation of a multitude of suffering. All right. So you'll notice that the original metaphor has been expanded upon a little bit where now ignorance has been included as this covering of darkness in that way. But the general metaphor of the karmic seeds of consciousness planted in the soil of conditioning or karma and then watered by craving in that way. So now... Unless there's any questions about anything so far, I know we've been going pretty heavy on the Dharma. We've already read from three different sutras. <laughs> All right. So really quickly, because I want to say a few more words about the yoga chara idea of, of the mental seeds. So let's just work with the initial uh, metaphor, the soil the seeds, and the moisture. So what we want to kind of recognize or notice about the metaphor here is, I mentioned this, this is what prompted uh, a lot of these ideas last week. We were talking about that we would, we would like there to be agency. I know there's this kind of desire in that way for free will. Like, no, no, I get to think what I want. I get to say what I want and I get to do what I want in that way. But then we introduced this idea last week of no, it's all habitual, right? And so it's this idea. And if you relate this back to the aggregates, which is what the nun Silla ultimately does, Remember, what they're saying, what the Buddha is saying, is that there is this body of form. So that's the first aggregate, the body of form. And the point is, is that this is not your arm. It is my arm in that it is my body of form. These are the kind of eyes I have, the kind of ears I have, the kind of nose, the kind of tongue, and it's all different than yours. So right away, there's a difference here in terms of kind of the processing of information, if you will, like my sensors are different. Or let me let me drop the first person pronoun at this point. They're not my sensors, but the sensors are different than those sensors. So the body of form is one thing. And like I'm always saying, if you were to lose a hand, it's not that you would disappear. There would just no longer be a hand in that way. So the body of form is changing all the time. Then there are sensations. So that's the second aggregate. So this experience that you're having right now, like this emergent experience that's happening right now, first of all, is the product of the sensory organs that are experiencing it. Then there is the actual sensations that are arising from those organs of form. And if something happened to your ears, your sensation of hearing would change. So your sensation of hearing is dependent upon the form of your ears. So right now you are that body of form that is then sensing or experience, or, you know, being, is sensing what it's sensing through the organs it's sensing it. Then there's perception, which I'll talk about in a second, but that's kind of about perceiving, seeing things, hearing things, smelling, tasting, touching. But what you're perceiving is being kind of processed through the filter of the conditioning, 
all of that past conditioning in that way. And so at any given moment, the fifth aggregate of consciousness is arising, but it's all dependent upon the conditioning and the perception is going through the filter of conditioning from the senses of your body of form. Notice how if you start changing any of that, the end result is going to change. Meaning, and by the end result, I mean the present state of conscious awareness. Now, really quickly, I want to remind you of this example. I often use this example, but what I like to do is I like to set up a hypothetical scenario where me and you are hanging out together and then there is a knock at the door and we both go over to the peephole and look through the peephole and we see this and one of us let's say let's say it's me i get a little like oh, a little nervous but you you're with me. You saw the same you you saw the same thing I did, right? But you get excited. And you're like, "Ooh, let's let's let it in." And I'm like, "No, let's not. Let's not let it in." And then we get to talking and I say, "Yeah, because I just I don't like ducks." And you say, duck that was a rabbit so right away there are two perceptions going on so this is where perception comes in i'm perceiving a duck but you're perceiving a rabbit so there's two different perceptions going on how's that and not only is there two different perceptions going on there's two different sensations going on which is that i'm having a negative sensation i'm getting a little nervous i'm saying no let's not let it in but your sensation is a positive sensation and you want more of it you're like let's let it in i want more bunny rabbit so we want to notice that there's your body of form and my body of form. You've got eyes, I've got eyes. So there's two different bodies of form. And then there is two different sensations perceiving two different things. But how is it that you're having a different sensation than I am? How is it that you're having a different perception than I am? That's because when I was a kid, my parents took me to a petting zoo and they gave me this really angry duck. And as soon as I tried to pet the duck, it bit me and I developed a habitual negative reaction to ducks. They always remind me of that day when I was a kid, when I got bit by the duck. And so I have this samskara. I have this conditioning regarding ducks and that's why i had a negative reaction because i don't like ducks but you you also went to a petting zoo when you were a kid but they gave you a bunny rabbit and it was the cutest little bunny rabbit and you just sat there all day petting it and it was the most delightful experience of your childhood so now when you see bunny rabbits, you get a warm, fuzzy feeling. So now you have your reaction, which is to say your sensation. I have my sensation. But I, I had a different reaction than you because I had a different perception than you. But I had a different perception than you because I have different conditioning than you. And so now the final end result of that is that 
I'm in a conscious state of awareness that is saying there's a duck outside there and I don't want to see it. But you're in a conscious state of awareness that's saying there's a bunny rabbit outside the door and I would like to see it. So two different states of consciousness because two different conditionings, two different reactions, two different perceptions, two different bodies. Everybody with me? So now what we want to talk about is that field of conditioning. So now what I mean is, is this, we need to really now start thinking much more deeply and more broadly, because what I mean is it's not just about that one day as a child, when I got bit by the duck, it's all the days, all the experiences, all the reactions, all the conditioning. So now we want to be thinking about our minds in that way as a field, a vast field of all of that conditioning. And so it's all of those, um, how can I put it? You know, it's not the, these conditionings too. It's like, you know, there can be really deep, indelible conditioning. You know, we might call that a trauma, like really deep conditioning. And then there's sort of more light conditioning, easily changeable in that way. But nonetheless, we want to be looking at sort of all of our prejudice. It's just that idea of all of the baggage, all of our preconditioning in that way. All right. So that's this field. And in that field, we are planting seeds of consciousness. Now, let's walk through it simply. So there's the knock on the door. I look out. I see the rabbit. And I go, ooh, a rabbit. So that's a, like a seed. That's a, a state of consciousness. And it's being planted in the field of samskara, the field of conditioning. And then I water it with craving. I really wish that duck would go away. I really wish, you know, I don't know why my friend here is having such a positive reaction to this duck. I wish that they would not go against my sense. My sense is this is bad. I don't know why they think this is good. So there's this craving, the craving for the duck to go away. And that's watering this seed, which is that it is a duck. So that seed's been planted in the field of my conditioning. And then I water it with my desire for the duck to go away. And then guess what pops right back up? That darn duck. <laughs> that darn duck keeps popping up again. So what we're interested in here as far as like Buddhism goes, we're interested in these kind of cyclical habits and being in kind of ruts, if you will, being in these habitual cycles in that sense. And so now let's say I have this field of my past karma, my past conditioning, and then there's thoughts, which are like seeds that are being planted in that field and then depending upon my craving, I'm watering them and they're sprouting. But now let's say I'm like, no, I don't, I really don't want to open the door. I don't really want to see the, see the duck. And you, my, my friend, you say, but it, it's not a duck. It's a rabbit. That's a bija. That's an idea. That's a seed 
that's now being, you know, your my friend, you are telling me it's a rabbit. Now, depending upon how I react to that, depending upon how I water that seed, I could potentially develop the idea, the idea could sprout. Oh, you're right. It's a rabbit. And my point is, is that I could eventually see the rabbit. But I would only be able to see the rabbit if I plant a seed in the field of conditioning and water it a certain way. And then it would sprout. And I could eventually, in that way, see the rabbit. Or to, to, to make this more practical, I could, rather than... So let's say I see the duck, I have my negative reaction. I could perpetuate that by kind of watering, again, watering that seed with the craving, and then that would keep this uh, duck phobia going in that way. But I want you to notice that there's a way that you could plant a seed to effectively overcome that trauma that disliking of ducks to where you could eventually be around ducks without the sprouts of discomfort popping up in that way all right everybody follow me everybody following all of that on the seeds soil watering sprouts all right so i do want to get to the next poem so because of that, I just want to mention one thing that's of importance. It, only because I've kind of gone this far talking about the karmic seeds. So what eventually happens is, is that this idea that apparently begins with a tiny little sutra way deep in the Anguttara Nikaya, that idea of the soil, the seeds, and the moisture eventually becomes part of the larger Mahayana tradition. That's why I read from the Avatamsaka Sutra. And then that idea of the seeds gets fully developed in the Yogacara tradition. And basically mind-only Buddhism or Yogacara Buddhism is entirely based upon this idea of the seeds. All thoughts are just these kind of outcroppings. And by all thoughts, I mean, all experience is just these seeds popping off. Now, what eventually happens, though, and this is where it gets a little tricky. You have to keep in mind that when Buddhism fully develops into the Mahayana and then ultimately Yogacara, what they're ultimately going to come around to is the idea that, remember, this is mind-only Buddhism. So there is no physical reality in this school of thought. It is all ideation. And what that means is you don't have a brain. You think you do. So now all of a sudden, the brain, mind, is no longer an object. It's not a thing because the brain is now just another idea. So what's having those ideas? This was the conundrum of the Yogacara school of thought, which is that if the idea of my brain is just another one of these fabricated delusional ideas, then what's having that idea in that way? And that's where the Yogacara school comes around and develops this really complicated idea of the alaya vinyana, the storehouse consciousness. And the storehouse consciousness is called the storehouse or the receptacle consciousness because it stores all the seeds 
all the karmic seeds are stored in the alaya vinyana. And then anytime you're having a thought about anything, it is actually the karmic seed popping out of the alaya vinyana, which is even thinking of yourself as being an embodied being is a seed that's coming to fruition, is sprouting up out of this alaya vinyana. The only thing that I can say more, and I want to reiterate it because I said it earlier, this is all metaphorical. There's no seeds. There's no alaya vinyana. All is empty. All is void. Nothing has svabhava. I, I want to remind everybody that, that if you're going to go and study Yogacara Buddhism, please remember that everything is empty with no svabhava. And therefore, we are not literally talking about seeds. There is no receptacle holding them all. This is all metaphorical to try to talk about something in that way, which is to talk about experience. Where's experience coming from? We have one more poem. So questions, comments, answers, ideas. And by the way, it all is gonna get tied up with the next poem, so. So. Yeah. So the first thing, and this is exciting, this is I, when, I, when I figured this out I, this afternoon, I was, uh, I was very excited. So, the last nun, her name is Vajira. But Vajira is the Pali pronunciation of a word. The last nun's name is Vajra. And when I found out that this nun's name was Vajra, well, let's just say I started wondering, hmm, um, but let's listen to what Vajra, Vajira, has to say. So at Shravasti, then in the morning, the Bhikkhuni Vajira, dressed and taking bowl and robe, entered Shravasti for alms. When she had walked for alms in Shravasti and had returned from her alms round after her meal, she went to the blind men's grove for the day's abiding. Having plunged into the blind men's grove. She sat down at the foot of a tree for the day's abiding. Then Mara, the evil one, desiring to arouse fear, trepidation, and terror in the bhikkhuni Vajira, desiring to make her fall away from concentration, approached her and addressed her in verse saying, by whom has this being been created? Where is the maker of this being? Where has this being arisen? Where does the being end or cease? Then it occurred to the Bhikkhuni Vajira. Now, who is this that recited this verse? A human being or a non-human being? <gasps> then it occurred to her, this is Mara, the evil one who has recited this verse desiring to arouse fear, trepidation, and terror in me, desiring to make me fall away from concentration. Then Bhikkhuni Vajira, having understood this is Mara the evil one, replied to him in verse saying, Why now do you assume a being? Mara, is that your specul speculative view? This is a heap of sheer formations. Here, no being is found. Just as with an assemblage of parts, the word chariot is used. So when the aggregates exist, there is this convention, a being. It is only suffering that comes to be. Suffering that stands and suffering that falls away. Nothing but suffering comes to be. Nothing but suffering ceases. Then Mara, the evil one, realizing, ah, the Bhikkhuni Vajira knows me, 
sad and disappointed, disappeared right there. So, a little bit of similarity between uh, Sela and Vajira's poems, but there's a shift. We move from the puppet to the sattva. So the word that's being translated as a being is the word sattva. You are familiar probably with the word sattva from like a bodhisattva, but I wanna remind you that the word sattva just means a being. And there could be all kinds of beings. I often mention that there is basically the idea of air beings, birds, water beings, water sattva, fish, land sattva, animals in that sense. And then notice that a bodhi sattva is a being but not of the land, sea, or the air, a being of Bodhi, a being of enlightenment. But that's a Bodhisattva. We're here, we're just talking about a sattva, a being, something, something there. And before I miss the chance to give you the the just the short version of this, it's the classic example of a chariot, of a car. And what it and I'm I'm using this example all the time. I mean, I'm usually I'm usually using my clock, but it's the same idea. A chariot, a car. Really? Really? There's just one thing here? There's not wheels and and let's for the sake of discussion assume this is a quote real car not a little toy car so the idea is is that there's wheels steering wheel engine axles all kinds of stuff and yet we call it a car and the idea is or the realization is that a car is a label and it's just a conventional designation. It has no svabhava. It has no existence to it. It is just a label, car. But that idea of the, the car though is just a conception, a label, nothing more. Just as with an assemblage of parts, the word chariot is used. Just so, when the aggregates exist, when the aggregates exist, there is the convention, a being, just one being, but it's a conventional designation. I want to rewind really quickly. Her first verse, her first stanza. Why now do you assume a being? Mara. Is that your speculative view? So it's why I definitely wanted to get to Vajira tonight because we talked about drishtis and views so much at the beginning of tonight. So I want you to recognize that the nun, Vajira, is calling out Mara for holding the view of a sattva. Now, I have to tell you this, if you don't, if you didn't know this, if you didn't catch it already, one of, if not the most important Mahayana Buddha Sutra is the Diamond Sutra, which of course is the Vajra Sutra. It's not the Diamond Sutra, it's the Vaj Vajira Sutta. So what is the message of the Vajra Sutra? The message of the Vajra Sutra is that there is no self-individuality, sattva, or even life. So I want you to kind of know, if you didn't, that the essential teaching of the Vajra or the Diamond Sutra is this teaching of no sattva. 
that there that there is no being that is just a conventional designation and so i find it very interesting that the nun named vajra her teaching that concludes this whole section is the teaching about there not being a sattva i i don't know but interesting nonetheless questions comments answers ideas about either of those poems we talked about tonight or any of the other sutras we talked about? Yeah, Maria. Well, I can't help but think about, um, I think my, I have a audio weirdness in a second. Um, but when I, my actual lived experience of the whole sort of um, duck rabbit thing where I was ignorant to that the duck or the rabbit. Now I can't even remember which one, but I couldn't see the other one. I was totally in the darkness of ignorance. And then just, it was like a switch got flipped and I could see both of them and then the chain was broken and now there's no going back <clears throat> like now I can't you know they're never going to have Svabhava again um, and I also thought about the like the same example in terms of like when you're looking through the peephole if it was like Your audio dropped. There we go. Oh, can, you, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, like if you had been bitten by a dog and the other person had a beautiful puppy experience or whatever it was. So that's like seeing the same thing as two totally different things. Um, <clears throat> but always, again, we're going back to emptiness. So Nice. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. And I would love to to reinforce something that Maria just said. And it's about when she was saying when she first saw the, the image and she could only see the one. And it's that that idea of being like locked into a view and being so locked into it that you wouldn't even think there's another possibility, let alone like you know, entertain that possibility. You didn't even know there was another possibility. And so I think, and she pointed out like that is ignorance. And so it's a great example of that idea of what is ignorance? Well, it's kind of believing what you believe in a way. So, yeah, no. Um, I, I'm a little uh, confused about the, uh, of, of the history of these sutras, it, hmm. the with regard to like you, your the last uh, one of these ten sutras seems to be referencing the Diamond Sutra, but didn't it come before the Diamond Sutra? Is the Diamond Sutra referencing it or? Oh, I would suggest because of its usage. With even within the Hinayana, so forget about Mahayana, they do use the language of Vajra wisdom. And Vajra wisdom is the wisdom that understands no self, that okay. cuts through that. Okay, so that idea is established in the in the Hinayana. Yeah. Okay. That that connection between Vajra and no self. Yep. Got it. Yeah. Got Thank you. And so yeah, it could be that this nun got that. And so the Buddha was like, yeah, you're you're called Vajra then, because you because you get it. Got or it. maybe there never was a nun exactly, and this poem is authored by Vajra. Who knows? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. 
So that concludes the uh, Bhikkhuni Vaga, the chapter on the nuns. Um, but stay tuned for more. Uh, we're really only beginning our, our exploration of the Samyutta Nikaya. I've got a few sutras already picked out for next week. So stay tuned for that, and we'll start a kind of a new mini-series. So, cool. Thank you.